Hey, what's up, everybody? Hope you are doing well. Continuing our coverage in the Brian Koberger case. It's been a big couple of days in the state of Idaho. Brian Koberger's defense team saying that they firmly believe in his innocence. I think and Taylor and crew must be losing their brain a little bit. I'm not sure, but lawyers for the Washington State University criminology PhD student who's been accused of massacring four University of Idaho undergrads in a home invasion stabbing, said that they firmly believe their client is innocent. Brian Koberger is a 29-year-old from Pennsylvania. He returned to the Latal County Courthouse for an afternoon hearing on defense efforts for a change of venue that also included a controversial survey that prompted the judge to ban both sides from contacting potential jurors. And I'll quote what the defense attorney says. Our defense team firmly, and I mean firmly, believes in Mr. Koberger's innocence. And right now he's having to be held to have a trial in a county that believes he's guilty. That's what they said. That's the quote. They said, and I mean firmly. Now let me just ask a question. <clears throat> In the chat section, do you think that Brian Koberger is guilty? Put a one in the chat. Do you think he's innocent? Put a two in the chat. Let me know. Let me know what you guys are thinking. Uh, my opinion, there's a lot of evidence against him. It'd be hard to prove to me otherwise. Okay, so for the second time in two weeks, the man accused of murdering four University of Idaho students was in a Latah County courtroom. And while the state and the defense and the judge are all trying to figure out how and where to hold his trial and how to pick a jury, uh, by the end of today's hearing, things got pretty salty. Prosecutors angry with the defense after Koberger's lawyer sent out a survey throughout the whole county asking questions about the case, some of them true, some of them not so true. Um, these folks won't actually need a jury, but let me let me show you a little bit of the hearing. Take a look, because it just got kind of nasty. Take a look. You acknowledge false that uh, Mr. Koberger allegedly stalked one of the victims. That's false. You know that to be false. Which one? Did Mr. Koberger allegedly stalked one of the victims? Yes. I was trying not to say that. Because but but, you, knew, but you, knew, you knew that was false. I did. Yes. And so you have now, for anybody who had never heard that before, that question is now planted in the, to them unqualified representation that Mr. Koberger stalked one of the witnesses, and that's false. That's false? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so they're not actually going to need a jury for about another year, right? Because trial's that long away. But lawyers for Koberger say it's futile to even start looking in Latah County because they say the whole jury pool there is biased against their client. And to prove their point, they hired a psychologist, that guy who was on the stand, to do a phone survey checking on the bias across the county against their client. But some people who got the call were really mad and they like called the police and the prosecutors called the judge and said, stop the survey. And the judge stopped the survey. So they're arguing, right? Like they wanna keep going with the survey. Um, but there's the whole issue of the gag order and everything, right? Today though, in this hearing, I'm so glad that I listened to it because the defense actually shared the questions in open court. You want to hear what they were? I thought you might. So I wrote them down and I have them right I here. I want to hear, I want to hear, I want to hear. 
Here we go. Okay. Uh, have you read, seen, or heard if Brian Koberger was arrested at his parents' home in Pennsylvania? That's question one. Question yes. two, have you read, seen, or heard if police found a knife sheath on the bed next to one of the victims? Yes. Number three, have you read, seen, or heard that DNA found on the knife sheath was later matched to Brian Koberger? Yes. Number four, have you read, seen, or heard if Brian Koberger owns the same type of car recorded seen driving in the neighborhood where the killings occurred? Yes. Number five, have you read, seen, or heard if the cell phone tower data showed that Brian Koberger made several trips near the victim's home in the month before the killing? Yes. Number six, have you read, seen, or heard if the university students in Moscow and their parents lived in fear until Brian Koberger was arrested for the murders? Yes. That's kind of interesting. Number seven, have you read, seen, or heard if Brian Koberger said that he was out driving alone on the night of the murders? Yes. Number eight, have you read, seen, or heard that Brian Koberger stalked one of the victims? No. This is really important, guys, because it's not true. And they said so in court. It isn't true. Anybody who reported that he was stalking a victim, they said in court it wasn't true. And the judge is pissed off that that question went out there because it's not true. Number nine, have you read, seen, or heard if Brian Koberger had followed one of the victims on social media? Thank you for watching. Go to News Nation. Come on, I want to see the whole episode. <clears throat> Nancy Grace goes into this. Koberger, Brian Koberger's trial erupts in anger in the courtroom. Are local and potential jurors being poisoned? I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. The judge erupts in anger in the courtroom as we learn the defense team for Brian Koberger has been reaching out by phone to potential jurors basically tainting the jury pool. But now we realize giving away their defense strategy. You know, it's been so long now since the quadruple sleigh in Idaho. Many people are getting fuzzy on the facts, and that's exactly what the defense wants. Delay, delay, delay is the defense attorney's best friend. But here's a harsh reminder. On the evening of November 12th and into the early morning hours of November 13th, Kaylee and Madison arrived home at approximately 1.45 a.m. after visiting a local bar and a street food vendor. Ethan and Zana were also out in the community at Sigma Chai and they arrived home at approximately 1.45 a.m. Two surviving roommates who were also out in the community arrived home at approximately 1 a.m. Later, on the morning of November 13th, at 11.58 a.m., a 911 call was placed. <clears throat> the call reported an unconscious person. The call originated from inside the residence, and a surviving roommate's cell phone was used. But it was not an unconscious person. Listen more to Police Captain Roger Lanier. During that call, the dispatcher spoke to multiple people who were on scene. Moscow police officers responded and found two victims, two on the second floor and two on the third floor of 1122 King Road. The results of autopsies indicated that the four were stabbed multiple times and were likely asleep during the attack. Some had defensive wounds and there was no sign of sexual assault. Joining me in All-Star Panel to make sense of what we know right now, but there is a major, major kerfuffle in the courtroom igniting anger from the judge. Is it true that Koberger's defense team has actually been communicating with potential jurors long before a jury is even struck? And is this an insidious way of tainting the jury pool and getting the change of venue they so desperately want Take a listen to Dave Mack, Crime Online. 
As the Koberger defense team moves ahead with their preparation to get the trial moved out of Latah County, they put together a research project and hired a polling company to conduct a survey of area residents and ask them questions about how much they may know about the murders. The company had reached around 400 residents before a concerned citizen recorded. Well, now <clears throat> it doesn't matter how many residents they would have reached because the whole wide world, including me and you, know what questions they were asking on uh, on that survey. Cat Joy, thank you so much for that super sticker. 911 Robert says, much love to the Feller fam. K me says, hi, Feller fam. Good to see you. Good to see you. Congratulations for being with us for 14 months. Rebecca Heck says, the fact that we all said yes to most proves the jury is tainted by media's rumors already. We shouldn't know any of this to be fair. I, I agree with that, but as long as it's a fact, I don't think it matters. I think what they're looking for is, do they think something that's not a fact is true? And the example that they put in there was the thing about stalking. So they're saying, hey, was he stalking one of the victims? Because apparently that's not true. And if they vote yes on that, that's where they would say they're tainted. Those other things that are actually true doesn't taint them. It just reinforces a fact in the case uh, that's going to be argued. So I think you make a great point. But the bigger point would be, how has social media and YouTube channels that have uh, perpetuated a lot of false information on both sides, but mainly pro Brian Koberger side, perpetuated uh, false ideas around this case? And uh, that's what taints the jury pool, not actually the facts. It, that's at least my opinion on that. Um, and Rebex says, no, I'm not in this court I'm trying to be neutral. So I understand your perspective. Thank you for your super chats. And I really appreciate you. Hope you were doing well. By the way, guys, I forgot to mention this, but we are totally crowdfunded, so I just want to invite you to be able to support us if you can. You can support uh, through Super Sticker, Super Chat. You can also support um, through what you guys are seeing down there on the bottom of the screen, PayPal, Cash App, or Venmo. One of the survey phone calls and contacted the district attorney's office to complain about the call. Prosecutors now say... The polling company was asking questions to plant negative opinions of Koberger in potential jurors' minds in the hopes the calls would serve to prove that local people were prejudiced against Koberger and the trial should be moved to another county. First, to highly respected journalist, the crime and courts correspondent at Newsweek, Sean O'Driscoll. Sean, thank you for being with us. What the hay is happening? Yeah, it is very serious development, Nancy. We have a situation where 400 jurors in a small county have now been contacted and told they've been given nine questions about how they feel about Brian Koberger. And those, those are questions that if they were ignoring this case, they now know an awful lot about it. Uh, very incriminating information about Brian Koberger that is now, as, as the prosecutor said, is now saturated with, the jur with potential jurors in the case. You know what's interesting? Uh, guys, with me, Sean O'Driscoll, Crime and Courts Correspondent, Newsweek. To Tara Malik, joining us, high-profile lawyer out of this jurisdiction uh, there in Idaho. It's smithmalik.com. Tara, if the state, the prosecution, had done this, you know what would happen? Very possibly a mistrial before the trial even starts with prejudice. In other words, the state may not be allowed to to retry the case. And this is a big deal, Tara. It's a very big deal. I mean, just to remind everyone, there's been a gag order issued by the judge. And so the parties are not supposed to be speaking publicly or disseminating publicly anything about the case. And so the judge um, certainly made it clear that he was displeased with the process that the defense had undertaken to go about this polling and you're talking about a small you know a, a small county uh, 400 people being contacted is a really big deal and some of those questions were certainly uh seem to be planting information or suggesting information that i think the prosecutor even remarked were not factually accurate and wouldn't be introduced at the trial itself Okay, I, I she sounded like um, a criminal procedure professor speaking to three L's, not one L's, but three L's, because they know a good bit of procedural language. Tara, let me break it down. 
these questions that were asked of potential jurors on the phone, and the judge got a hold of an audio tape. Somebody taped one of these calls from the defense. And they it brings up issues that may not even be allowed at trial. Hey, let, let's see the tears of what exactly was asked of these potential jurors. Nine questions that we know of. The judge, whose last name is Judge, Judge Judge, let me just say, royally PO'd, technical legal term. Okay, here we go. Have you read, seen, or heard if Brian Koberger was arrested at his parents' home in Pennsylvania? Well, whoa, wait a minute. What if the circumstances of that arrest had been thrown out? What if the jury wasn't allowed to hear that he was apprehended standing in his kitchen, his parents' kitchen, in his uh, in some shorts, I think possibly his underwear, wearing rubber gloves, separating trash? Okay, right there, strike one. What normal guy is wearing rubber gloves in his parents' kitchen, in his underwear, separating the trash? Okay, number two, have you read, seen, or heard if police found a knife sheath on the bed next to one of the victims? Okay, that goes straight to finding DNA. Let's see the next set of questions. Nine questions in all. Very quickly, if I could see three and four. Have you read, seen, or heard that DNA found on the knife sheath was later matched to Brian Koberg? Okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What if by some impossible feat, the defense managed to get that DNA thrown out? Well, now they've just tainted the jury pool by telling them there was DNA on the knife sheath that matched to Brian Koberger. Four, have you read, seen, or heard? To Rebecca's point, they're tainting the jury pool. Jennifer Swain and Kat Joy, thank you guys so much for your tremendous support. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If Koberger owned the same type of car reported seen driving in the neighborhood where the killings occurred. Right there, we see where the defense is going. We all know his vehicle was spotted in the area. Hold on, Liz. Cart before the horse. But now we see they're headed towards saying that just looked like his car, not his car. Five, have you read, seen, or heard if the cell phone tower data showed Koberger made several trips near the victim's home in the month before the killing? That tells me they're going to attack the cell phone tower information. Have you read, seen, or heard if university students in Moscow and their parents lived in fear until Koberger was arrested for the murders. What does that tell me? They're going to tell the jury that Koberger's arrest was premature and police were pressured because everyone was living in fear. Let's see the rest. Let's see number seven. Have you read, seen, or heard if Koberger said he was out driving alone the night of the murders? Man, I'd come up with a different alibi if I could. Uh, but sadly for them, they've already committed to this. They can't change it now. Eight, have you read, seen, or heard Koberger stalked one of the victims? And nine, have you read, seen, or heard if Koberger had followed one of the victims on social media? And you know what's interesting? That may not even come into evidence. Allegations that Koberger had been stalking, and we think it was Kelly Gonsalves, not sure yet, one of the victims on social. That may never come into evidence. Okay, back to our all-star panel to Sean O'Driscoll, crime and courts correspondent for Newsweek. Hey, Sean, I want you to take a listen to the prosecutor. Angry. This is him angry in court. Listen. Your Honor, there is absolutely no question, but that those questions are disseminating by means of communication evidence expected to be presented evidence that could be or would be inadmissible at trial. And I will say it, there are a number of these representations placed in the form of a question, but representations of fact that are not true or that would not be offered at trial. Sean O'Driscoll uh, joining us from Newsweek. They're basically leading questions, which is what the prosecutor or the defense would do if they had a witness from the other side on cross-examination, you basically give your theory of the case one sentence at a time, and at the end you say, isn't that true? 
That's basically what these questions are. Now, tell me the whole thing. How did this go down, Sean? Well, they hired a, a polling company for the defense to try and show that there was too much um, bias against Brian Coger, Koberger in the local county. Um, so then they called somebody, that person got a bit suspicious of the call, recorded the call, and then went to the DA's office to make a complaint about it. And that's when they learned about all of these questions. And as you say, they are leading questions. I mean, the very definition of a leading question is whether you can answer it with a yes or no question, all of which, in this case, you can. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's like, are you aware that Nancy Grace is accused of stealing a handbag and that we all now live in fear of her? I mean, it's, it's so tainting the jury pool, as the prosecutor says, that um, it's, it's difficult to see how they can how they can continue on with this because 400 people are now aware of all of these questions. And as Tara Malik pointed out, a high profile lawyer there in Idaho, it's a very small jurisdiction. Hey, there's nothing wrong with being a small jurisdiction. I grew up in rural Bibb County. We were not even in a city. Uh, a very idyllic childhood. So this city people keep saying oh it's small uh -huh. like there's something wrong with it but what that means for us is that this has a more profound effect on a smaller jury pool because 400 people out of a jury pool of 3,000 is a lot that's a hypothetical let me bring in our other guests I want to go first to Chris McDonough he is the director of the Cold Case Foundation former homicide detective with hundreds and hundreds of homicide investigations under his belt. I found him on the interview room. And what fascinated me with what he did along with his wife, they were driving at about two miles an hour. This is before I went to Moscow and showing me everything I needed to know about the layout of where the murder scene was, the roads that led to it. They're very narrow. There were so many evidentiary details in that drive along. I had to meet this guy and everything I learned in that video turned out to be true. Chris McDonough and Joe Scott Morgan, I want to talk to the two of you. Uh, Joe Scott, of course, is professor of forensics, Jacksonville State University, author of Blood Beneath My Feet on Amazon. He is a death investigator and he is the host of Body Bags with Joe Scott Morgan podcast. Now, to Chris and Joe Scott. First to you, Chris. We're talking about courtroom antics. Can we talk about what this case is about? Because as... It feels like courtroom antics. and <clears throat> I can't believe that the defense actually thinks Brian Koberger is innocent. I mean, I put the question in the poll. Do you think Brian Koberger is guilty or innocent? Amy High says, like, there's, no, there's been no other death. Ain't nobody dying since Brian Koberger's been in jail. Great point, Amy Heights. Really great point. By the way, guys, one thing we do just once per show is something we call a super sticker train. It's just a fun way to invite people to support us. We're going to set a goal of 15 super stickers for anybody who wants to come alongside and support us today. Liz and Jackie were showing me photos and sound. We're kind of forgetting about the four victims. Look at them. Look at them. This is them in life. Joe Scott's going to tell you about how they were found in death. But isn't it true, Chris McDonough, that so often the victims get lost in the sauce of all the courtroom antics? I mean, I could just snap the head off this defense attorney, Ann Taylor, if I could get close enough to her. Chris, bring it all home. What about... I don't think she should say that. Did she just say she's going to snap Ann Taylor's head off like a turtle? Sauce of all the courtrooms. Listen to what she says. I, mean, I could just snap the head off this defense attorney, Ann Taylor, if I could get close enough to her. Chris, bring it all home. What about these victims losing their lives? Yeah, let's never forget that, right, Nancy? I mean, here you have four innocent um, college students with their whole lives ahead of them. I mean, and then they're slaughtered in their bedroom while they're sleeping. And they're, that means generations now have stopped uh, instantly. No more, you know, grandbabies, et cetera, for the, for the surviving family members as well. So this is a huge, huge situation. 
where the victims do get lost sometimes through the courtroom. And I think it's imperative that um, not only the community around there, but you know, to your point, the world remember, they have to remember that the victims here need justice and that justice needs to come swiftly sometimes. And these court romantics like this sometimes, you know, clog that wheel. This is, this is a very, um, not a usual case from the law. And you know that we've been working very, very hard to keep the sort of noise out of the case. And now it's been injected, at least to these four, 400 people, without a permission of the court, without discu discussion with, with the state, I mean, that's troublesome. And then, and then when I'm being accused, directly accused, okay, by you in your brief, that I violated his due process rights. Now, that's not what the law says, and that's not what the facts are. Violating Koberger's due process rights. <laughs> No way. This guy is reportedly getting vegan meals, his own TV, control of the remote, visits, you name it. I guarantee you he's getting love letters. Think about that for a moment. What is the judge talking about? That he, the judge who is judge, judge, judge is his last name, that he is somehow violating the rights of Koberger? I'll tell you, in a nutshell, first of all, the Koberger judge slamming the defense for quizzing local potential jurors, basically causing an error in the trial yet to be and guaranteeing a change of venue, which is what they want, but also a very insidious, um, sneaky thing they did was that when the judge wanted to stop the polling, they are now claiming that is violating Koberger's right to due process. What is due process? It means that basically you're getting treated fairly under the system that we have established in the U.S. You get a right to a jury. You get a right to a fair jury. You get a right to a trial. You get a right to a lawyer, even if you cannot afford one. There's a whole host of rights and privileges and everyone is to be afforded due process, a fair trial. They're now claiming the judge has taken that away from Brian Koberger. He's kicked back having his vegan meal right now, laughing his rear end off. Okay. I want to. Do you think. <laughs> do, you, do you think that Brian Koberger is watching Nancy Grace? He's. <laughs> He's kicked back. He's kicked back. <laughs> Enjoying his vegan meal. Let's listen to what she has to say. Listen to what he says. Listen to what she just says. Due process. A fair trial. They're now claiming the judge has taken that away from Brian Koberger. He's kicked back having his vegan meal right now, laughing his rear end off. Oh my gosh, hilarious. Okay, I want to talk one more moment before we go back into what's happening right now, the anger that has been ignited in this courtroom. And I want to go to Joe Scott Morgan, a professor of forensics, Jacksonville State University. Joe Scott, a lot is being made of trial maneuvers. I want to talk about how these four beautiful young Idaho students were found. See, we're seeing them in life. That's not how they were found. That is not how, according to the state, Koberger left them. Explain. Chris mentioned the term a little while ago uh, of slaughter. And I, I'd say that that kind of sums it up, uh, what we're talking about here, because we're talking about multiple stab wounds and not just stab wounds. If we are to believe what has been released relative to these defensive injuries and also one injury in particular uh, defensively where it sounds as though perhaps the knife was actually drug across the palm of one of the victim's hands, cutting all the way down to the tendons. These were viable 
young, lovely students, children, somebody's children, certainly, that love them very much. And now they're absolutely gone. And Nancy, one other thing here that we really have to plumb the depths of here, uh, aside from, you know, all of these wranglings that they're talking about, this is, okay, if I were to rate this case one to 10, 10 being the most complex relative to the forensics that are involved, this is going to be right at about a 10 because you're dealing with all of these various facets that we're going to have to examine and be examined in court. We just talked about them outside the, the context of the courtroom. When you get into this, when you really begin to dig in, there's going to be a tremendous amount of blood evidence, not to mention this DNA evidence that has been at the, the point of the spear with all of this and the electronic evidence. Then something that has raised its head along the way is this forensic genealogy that's also come into play. And so the case is complex enough and you're going to throw this into this mix and you really, really, if you think the, the jury pool is tainted at this point, my concern is that the continuity of the evidence is going to be bespoiled in this as well, because this narrative is going to be highly complex to be able to lay out to a jury so that they understand it. I have uh, the experience that jurors understand really well, exactly, even complex scientific evidence that they've been given. Joe Scott, you've been to many, many crime scenes, as have I. Um, I remember my first mass killing. There were three dead bodies. Blood was literally running down a gutter because one of the young boys that had been shot down on a playground around 11 p.m. on a Sunday night had made a run for it and he got as far as a chain link fence. He was jumping the fence when he too was shot dead and he hung on the fence for an extended period of time, bleeding out into the gutter below the fence. By the time I saw it, blood was literally running down the gutter. Liz, if I could please see these victims in life, because that crime scene, Joe Scott, was horrific. That's the kind of crime scene that makes rookies go out and throw out, throw up outside. Four incredible, beautiful, vivacious. Look at them, students. Their bodies by that time, cold, ripped open, going into rigor. The smell of decomp had probably already started. The sticky blood was coagulating on sheets on the floor throughout the home. And that feeling, that heavy feeling in the air where a dead body is, a murdered body, is what greeted police. That, Joe Scott Morgan, is what we're talking about as the defense does one cartwheel after the next to get the client off. You're absolutely right, Nancy. And, you know, there's, there's this idea that the blood will tell. And, the, and what I meant by that was that the deposition or the depositing of the blood within, within the bedrooms and not to mention anywhere else that we might not have an awareness of at this point in time, that's going to be a complex story to tell. And remember, we're already missing the house. It's gone, okay, at this point. So, again, why on earth is that house gone? The whole wide world's like, yo, what the heck is the situation? We need that house, okay? And then they knock it down. Amy Hides, thank you so much for that amazing super sticker. Really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, we're, we have a goal of 15, uh, so really appreciate that. It's number one on our Super Chief training. We're relying upon how the scene was documented. I'm sure that they'll do a fantastic job presenting it, but we're absent that already. So their blood, those images that we have, are going to be very important to tell the tale. We have heard mention that Kaylee stated she may have had a stalker.
Detectives have been looking into that and to this point have been unable to corroborate the statement, although we continue to seek information and tips regarding that report. No suspects have been named or arrested, and we continue looking for what we believe to be a fixed blade knife used in the murders. You are hearing Police Captain Roger Lanier in Moscow, Idaho, talking about the possibility that one of the Idaho victims most likely to be Kelly Gonzalez, was stalked on social media. What does that have to do with the Koberger case? Why is he talking about that? Obviously, because it's connected. Now, when we look at these questions the defense has posed on phone calls to 400 of the jury pool, number nine says, have you read, seen, or heard Brian Koberger had followed followed one of the victims on social media. Well, that tells me right there, uh, Tara Malik joining me, high profile lawyer at Smith and Malik in Idaho. That tells me that if that evidence does come in, that Koberger had been trying to hook up with one of the victims or follow them or stalk them, as it has been stated, they're going to try to argue he just followed one of them innocently. So that tells me where they're going with that. Yeah, potentially. I mean, I think that they're trying to, or they may try and explain away if there is some evidence that Koberger either came in contact or was familiar with these folks and, and put it, as you mentioned, in an innocent spin on it. Um, you know, there certainly seems to be, from what we know right now, a lot of evidence to suggest that um, he's, he, this was a very calculated, uh, crime and that he may have done some research ahead of time before it was actually committed, um, familiarity with the location with perhaps at least one of the individuals. So, uh, certainly gives us some hints as to what the defense may be trying to do or set up for. Although, you know, Ann Taylor did say in court that she did not draft the particular questions. She did approve the topics uh, that were um, used by the pollster in formulating the questions themselves. Tara, did you just say that the defense lawyer, Ann Taylor, she didn't write the questions, she just approved them? Did I hear that? That's correct. From what her statements were or her arguments were in court to Judge Judge, she indicated that she had not actually written the questions that were used in the poll, but that she had approved the topic. How is that a good defense from her? By the way, thank you, Tim's Cajun Adventures, Joanne Byerly and Jennifer Swain for your amazing support. She also indicated that um, the pollster was not given any facts from her team or any evidence from her team prior to putting those questions together. Got it. I got it. I got it, Tara. Yes, I hear your defense of Ann Taylor, and I'm sure she appreciates it. <laughs> I think that's a line of BS. I really do. To Dr. Leslie Dobson joining us, forensic psychologist at drlesliedobson.com. You say potato, I say potato. So you can't have it both ways. Although, Tara Malik, that's why she wins so many cases, is giving it a valiant try to defend the defense attorney here. You can't say the pollsters who, who actually made these phone calls at the behest of the defense, they knew nothing about the case. You can't say that. And the defense lawyer didn't make up these questions. Okay, somebody directed these questions. And if the pollster knew nothing about the case, then how did they come up with the questions? Bottom line, the defense approved these questions. It'd be a cold day in H-E-L-L that they use money for a pollster and they don't approve of the questions. That would be like me sending you, Dr. Leslie, for a polygraph and I don't come up with or help create the questions for the poly. That's not happening. The polygrapher doesn't know what to ask. I have to tell him or her what to ask and then they put it in the right format. So you can't have it both ways. Polster had no idea about the case, and we didn't write those questions. B.S. How could she even say that in front of the judge? Does she think he's an idiot? Because he's not. 
Yes, I read that a social psychologist was hired to put the questions together. So the information was gained through what he claimed was in the media and readily available. Okay, question to you, Dr. Leslie Dobson. So the defense hires a pollster to call the locals and ask them questions about the facts of the case prior to jury selection. As you have heard the questions today, they touch on very significant parts of the case, critical parts of the case. So do you really believe the defense didn't know what the questions were going to be after they paid for a pollster? I don't believe it, no. Having worked with many, many attorneys in criminal and civil law, I, I think the game is on full display right now. Following up with Chris McDonough, who has been to the crime scene, has analyzed the crime scene, and has handled well over 300 homicide investigations. Jump in, Chris. You know, Nancy, I think one of the things that you've pointed out here is, you know, there are 400 uh, potential witnesses. Remember, she, the defense put that in one of their motions. Well, how would they know there are 400 potential witnesses when, of course, you've got now 400 people that have been polled in the community? Uh, I think that's an interesting correlation that would need some clarity. Uh, and I'm concerned that the prosecution kind of fell for it by actually reading those questions in open court and why the judge didn't pull them into you know, into in-camera hearing to where the public now, everybody knows about these nine questions wait, around wait, the wait. world. Wait, wait, wait. Are you seriously trying to say with a straight face, Chris McDonough, that anybody watching this coverage hasn't already heard about the Koberger case? No, not at all. In fact, what I'm saying is these nine questions which are being argued you know, by both the prosecution and the defense are now known to everybody. Uh, that's what I'm saying. And, and that in of itself you know, kind of goes against the, the, the purpose of uh, the hearing. Judge John Judge set an April 17th deadline for Kohlberger's legal team to provide documents related to an alibi. Does anybody else kind of get the feeling that the defense is walking all over John Judge, John Judge, Judge, Judge? Cat Joy, good to see you. Thank you for letting the super stickers flow. Really appreciate that. Rocking and rolling, guys. We're four super stickers away from reaching our goal today. Last year, at least two possible alibis were set out by Koberger's attorney. The first saying it was Koberger's habit to go for long drives alone late at night. Defense attorney Ann Taylor later gave the court brief information saying, quote, evidence cooperating Mr. Koberger being at a location other than the King Road address will be disclosed pursuant to discovery and evidentiary rules, as well as statutory requirements, unquote. The location has not been revealed. So the defense is sticking to the rigorous guidelines of the law and deadlines and limitations when it suits them, but now are caught red-handed poisoning the jury pool. In a small jurisdiction, you bring in 400 people and they've all been quizzed already about the case by the defense pollster. Guarantee you that is going to be caused for a change of venue. Why? Why is that significant? Tara Malik, uh, it's significant because when you change a venue, it's much harder on the state. It is. I mean, we're talking about uh, moving witnesses who may be local to that community to a different location to testify. Uh, maybe even for multiple days. So it does put the burden on the state, puts on the burden on the defense as well, but we don't, they don't have to put on a defense. They don't have, if they don't want to, and they certainly don't have to put on witnesses if they don't want to. Uh, the burden is entirely on the state. Now this defense has taken the step of saying that we do have an alibi, which puts the burden on them to um, come up with that alibi. But uh, yeah, it, it, is going to add some complications here that that didn't already exist. And and I would note too, you know, that for the change of venue, it's just pretrial publicity alone 
is not enough to change venue in a particular case. Like that's certainly not enough. To Sean O'Driscoll joining us from Newsweek. Sean, talking about an alibi and the defense, of course, has not handed over the alibi yet. They've got to hand over an alibi because the state has a right to question witnesses or evidence that support that alibi, be it surveillance video, be it the NAV system in Coburger's Elantra. The state has a right to question that alibi. Did you hear what was said that they may bring on corroboration for the alibi that he is driving around at three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning. And Hey, Sean, while I've got you, this is a real clue as to where they're headed with these nine questions they sent to all the jur to potential jurors uh, about the car. They asked specifically uh, whether the potential juror has found out or heard about the type, same type of car seen in the neighborhood where the murders occurred. So they're basically tipping us off that the defense is going to be, yeah, there was a white Elantra, but it wasn't him. Right. In fact, part of the prosecution case in their own documents that they filed in court is that they have an FBI expert who's not only an expert on models of cars, but even regional variations within those models of cars who then linked this type of car somewhere between 2011, 2014, then expanded that range slightly by looking at the CCTV of slightly slight parts of the car. So I think what the defense are really trying to say is, yeah, okay, you've got us, his car was around, you have it on CCTV, that type of model of car, but his his hobby is to drive around in the middle of the night in this particular car, which is actually common common purpose between defense and prosecution in this case. That that okay, nice hold on, Sean O'Driscoll, uh, crime and courts correspondent at Newsweek. Let me ask you a quick question regarding that. Can you have it both ways? Can you claim, as they apparently are going to do, as evidenced by this question, have you heard the same type of car? was spotted in the area, clearly tipping me off that they're going to argue, yeah, there was a white Elantra, but it wasn't his. Do you have the light? I think it's interesting. <clears throat> we get to see a, a peek into their strategy, and it certainly feels like they're going to try to use little cliffhangers like that, right? To try to like, mm, you said type. It's going to become a semantic thing. And that's just ridiculous. Looking at the answer in our poll, go ahead in the poll, 82% of you guys think Brian Koberger is guilty because the stack of evidence against him is substantial. License plate? No. In fact, it could be an entirely different year, make or model. Okay, they're going to argue it wasn't his car. But is that consistent with the alibi? Yeah, he was out driving around at 3 or 4 o'clock that night in the morning. So is it him driving by there, by the murder scene? Or is it not his car? To me... That's inconsistent. But I see them bit by bit, Sean, trying to dismantle the state's case. That's what this is to them. They're taking each piece of strong evidence and trying to dismantle it. Piece of evidence. His car was spotted at the scene. Hello, at 3 o'clock in the morning. And then he went back by later that day. They're going to claim that looked like his car, but it wasn't his car. And by the way, he often drives around late at night, all alone, which screams to me, freaky dude. Right. I mean, you have to really wonder. You have to take jurors as normal people like all of us who are wondering, okay, where was he? Well, he was driving around in, a, in the same type of model of car that night. Um, and also, how does this then play into jury selection? If the jury, if the jurors are now, 400 of them are, uh, have been told all of this, what does, what does the defense now know about those 400 people that hasn't been disclosed yet. You know, what, what have they written down their names? Did they know their addresses when they're when it comes to jury selection? Do they now know what all of those juror, potential jurors now know about this model of car, about what they know about the DNA evidence and all sorts of information? The families of Kaylee Gonzalez and Xander Canodal issued a public statement sharing their frustration in not having a trial start date yet. 
Latok County Prosecutor Bill Thompson says he could be ready to present his case in March of 2025, while Koberger's lead attorney, Ann Taylor, says she will not be ready until June 2025. Taylor also says she plans to call 400 witnesses in a trial expected to last six weeks. In their open letter, the Gonzalez and Cronodo family statement begins with, why are victims' families so misunderstood? The letter concludes with, we want to stop. There's absolutely no evidence that points towards his innocence other than innocent until proven guilty. There's substantial evidence that points towards his guilt. I mean, it's as easy for me to understand as about anything that I've ever actually thought of in my entire life. I mean, this dude has this fact stacked against him. 95% of people think he's guilty. He was at 1122 King Road 12 times. He left his house on the night of the murder at 244. There were multiple sightings of his car near 1122 King Road between 330 and 425. His car parked at 404. He left in his car at 420. That's about the time the murder took place. His DNA was found on the knife sheath at the crime scene. He went back to the crime scene the day after at 9, 12 a.m. before anybody even knew that that was a crime scene. He turned his phone off at the exact time the crime was committed. He was separating his DNA from the trash while the SWAT team arrested him. He was putting his trash in the neighbor's bin. An eyewitness described his height, his build, and unique characteristics. They found a receipt in his apartment with supplies consistent with the eyewitness statement. His professor at DeSales is actually an expert on serial killers. There's a receipt from an Amazon purchase that he made of a K-Bar knife. There's reports of him having his phone multiple times connecting to Wi-Fi at the 1122 King Road or nearby homes. There were multiple ID cards found inside a glove, inside of a box, inside of his house in Pennsylvania, including somebody from 1122 uh, King Road. He had meticulously cleaned his car out multiple times, including being spotted by police officers. There's multiple reports of Brian Koberger having questionable interactions with women, including stalking, uh, harassing, etc. He was arrested in 2014. He had a job as a fish cutter. He wore gloves a lot. He had interview questions for a research project that was about getting to the mind of a criminal before, during, and after a crime. He changed his vehicle license plate after the crime. Many people think he's Papa Roger. On Facebook groups, he can run a six-minute mile, and he was kicked out of a bar in Idaho and Washington State as a student there because he was creeping the women out. The evidence is stacked against him, and their only defense, he likes to drive around. Start healing. We do. We want to find justice and try to move on from this horrible tragedy. So please, please start making some decisions. Can you believe by the time this goes to trial, around three years will have passed since the murders? Uh, to you, Joe Scott Morgan, death investigator, you have been on so many thousands of homicide and uh, death scenes, the longer you wait to go to trial. And I've been there. One of the first cases I had to try, not the first, but one of the first was to retry a case that had been tried when I was back in law school. And I've told you this, Joe Scott, when I went into the evidence room to get the evidence, there was one x-ray. I didn't even know what it was or who it went to, what it had to do with the case. And a baseball cap that said, kiss my bass. That was all the evidence we could find from the first trial. I'm serious. And I had to cobble together a case. As time goes on, memories dim. You lose evidence. Witnesses actually die. They had died in those 14 years before I had to retry that case. So that's the problem with the delay. But what about what it does to the victim's families? Every day, no justice. It grinds on and on and on. And I still have a vivid memory of hearing this. We had gotten back from church and that particular day and when this case dropped. And now even, even to this point, as much as I've covered this case with you, Nancy, some of the details are beginning to fade for me. How much more so? Because, I, I you know, we do this regularly. Uh, but, you know, all of the principles. And here's, here's one other interesting little aside here. Uh, this is a university environment, Nancy, and we all know what happens at university environment in university uh, environments. People move on with their lives, and what I mean by that is, you have kids that may have been witnesses at that particular time.
their life has gone on. As a matter of fact, many of them may have graduated. They're going to have to be coming back to this environment. The, the landscape has changed. We no longer have a home to recall uh, what happened that particular night. So everything is going to rest uh, upon what is contained within that evidence room that you peripherally mentioned just a second ago. And, you know, the, I can tell you who hasn't forgotten the people that walked into that structure and they saw that bloodbath and they saw what had happened. And it's just as real to them right now as it was that day. We wait as justice unfolds, and now we stop to remember American hero Sergeant Mark McIntyre, just 55, McIntyre shot and killed in the line of duty, Griffin, Georgia. A proud vet of the U.S. Army, dedicated member of the community, leaving behind daughter Kimber, son Parker, fiance Karen, and her sons. American hero, Sergeant Mark McIntyre. Thank you to our guests. Heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. Guys, what do you think about this evidence slide that I went through? I mean... A lot of evidence stacked against Brian Koberger. Not any real thing in his favor. So it's, it's just the thing I hate for it is the family, like the Gonsalves family themselves. I mean, they're just heartbroken. They're having a hard time. Moving on. I mean, it really is. It's just absolutely heartbreaking. So we need to be praying for their family. I, I follow the Gonsalves family page on Facebook, and they just talk about it a lot. They just, it's, they're in a hard situation. We need to pray for the families. Let's, let's just do that. Let's just pray for the families that have been, you know, waiting for justice so they can have peace. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we just lift up the Gonsalves family, the Chapin family, Maddie's family, Zana's family, Lord, that they would actually, um, in this time, just have, uh, instead of a restlessness in their soul, a supernatural peace. I just bless them with that now, Lord. Your word actually says that you're close to the brokenhearted, that you give a peace that surpasses all understanding. And so, Lord, I pray right now there's a supernatural peace that rushes over those families. And I bless them in the name of Jesus. Yeah. It's hard to even understand, God, how and why things like this could happen. But I know you're the God that takes our mess and turns it into a message. And so, Lord, I pray that there, there are uh, people filled with hope, and they rise up to share a message with the world uh, that the world will hear. So I bless them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you guys so much for being on the stream today. And uh, we'll be back again very soon. And Jennifer Swain says, Cabooses. Thank y'all. Cabooses. Thank you, Jennifer Swain, for your amazing support. Thank you for everybody who hopped aboard our Super Sticker Train today. You are awesome. And uh, we'll be back again very soon. See you guys on Faith Friday.